Chino was an orphan boy that reincarnated into a different world after accidentally meeting his doom. In this new world, however, the seven gods bestowed upon him a cheat leveling system, granting him stats to become the most overpowered human ever. While walking home one day, Sheena saw people rushing out of a store chaotically, and two girls tripped right next to him. The thief waved his knife around and began sprinting towards the ladies. But instead of abandoning them, Sheena rushed towards him, tackling him down. He screamed at the girls to escape, but before he knew it, he began bleeding out of his stomach, causing the bandit to run away in fear. In his last moments, he was glad to have saved those two girls, but wished he didn't end up making them cry. His consciousness began fading, but when he opened his eyes, he found himself in a mysterious room. A maid began crying and calling him Cain, confusing him. Mommy Milkers came to hug Cain, asking him if he remembers his mother. None of this makes any sense to Cain, but when he takes a single glance at the mirror, he begins panicking, wondering who he's become. After being in a coma for a week, the maid thinks that his fever is messing with his memory. His mother asks Sylvia to go and prepare him soup, and after they leave the room, Cain still has no idea how he's become a child. He wonders if he's an anime protagonist in an isekai. This guy's onto us. Without wasting any time, he begins investigating his entire room to find any overpowered weapons, but it appears he still has an Asian persuasion. Sylvia thinks he wet himself, but poor Kane cries for losing all his manhood. After she left the room, Kane was able to extract all the information he wanted out of her. His name is Kane Gon Von Silford. What a fucking name. A three-year-old boy born to Garm, and Sarah, with a sister called Rianee. However, Garm is a top G and has a second wife, Maria, and she's given birth to his two older siblings. His father is a high-ranking margrave and commands an army to protect his kingdom's borders from a forest of monsters. Kane is excited to hear there's monsters, but the maid tells him there's adventurers who can wield magic, and Kane gets excited. Sylvia promises to teach him some magic as long as he can learn to read, so he begins practicing right away. When Kane learned about magic, he knew he wanted to live the rest of his life here. Because in his last world, his parents had already perished and his last relative, his grandpa, had just passed away, leaving him with nothing to miss. During dinner, Garm learns that his son can write, and Reen tells him that he can do math already as well. Sarah thinks her son is a genius, but Kane compliments Sylvia for being the best maid in the world. His parents get suspicious about why he became studious out of nowhere, and Sylvia sticks the milk that she extracted from his mother's plot. Garm wishes he was there to witness the extraction. Kane explains that he just wants to learn all about this world so he can become an adventurer, and Garm commends him on being so motivated. To help him pursue his curiosity, Garm allows him to read all of his magic books, but warns him that he won't be able to use magic until he's baptized at the age of five. His mother thinks he won't be able to use magic until then anyways, but the mischievous plot maker is already cooking up fire with his hand. He realizes that he can already use magic and has achieved every otaku's dream. But while casting his next spell, his hands burn and he begins losing control. Kane thinks that these magical abilities will allow him to become the strongest edge lord. The only thing left to complete his otaku dreams is a cis con relationship to top this all off. Oh wait, there we go. Rianne sneaks into the room, telling him that she's discovered all about his secrets. She's discovered that he's been studying the outside world in secret, and Kane is glad that his sister is an idiot. From then on, his sister taught him all about the outside world and about the first adventurer who built this kingdom, Yuya. Kane realizes that this guy is from a different Annie Climax video, but decides to just ignore it. After learning all about the wonders of the world, he couldn't wait two more years until his baptism, but the day finally came. He walked inside with his new outfit and his family was impressed by how handsome he'd become. They head off with horse carriages throughout the entire town, and Kane is surprised to see this medieval-looking world for the first time. He's curious about the blessing of the gods so he asks his sister to see her status window. He's marveled by all of her stats, but sees she has the Brocon status. She immediately tells him to forget whatever he just saw, and Kane pretends he has no idea what she's talking about. His father explains that there are multiple levels to the protections granted. Each magic protection is given between level 1 to 5, and they're given by the gods to determine one's prowess in a specific field. They head to the church for Cain to receive his protections, and the priest begins the baptism. Before their eyes, the pillars of the gods begin to shine a blinding light, and Cain is teleported to meet with all seven gods. They welcome him by his real name, Sheena, and Cain wonders what the hell. Sorry I meant what the heaven is going on. 
Zenim, the god of creation introduces himself, but Cain thinks that Christmas came early this year because this nutcase looks like Santa Claus. Zenim tells him that he can hear everything he's thinking, and moves on to talk about his reincarnation. Cain's death was unexpected, because in reality, even if he didn't stop the criminal, he would have fallen and everyone would have restrained him. He's basically just a useless dweeb who isekai'd himself because he wanted to simp over two girls. It's an evil world we live in. The goddess apologizes for being so harsh, but since he met his doom for a good deed, they reincarnated him to keep his life going. Even though he looks stupid, Cain isn't upset one bit. After all, he's been reincarnated into a loving family and can now use magic which is one of his dreams. Reno, the god of magic, bestows upon him the protection of magic since he's been working so hard. Zenim grants him his protection as well, along with the god of war, making him the strongest jujitsu warrior there is. The god of technology grants him a bigger brain so he can stop simping over women, and the god of commerce grants him the judgment ability and item box so he can become the richest top G. The god of earth comes and gives him the greatest protection of all, the power to develop plot. Zenim tells him that his status window will show him the effect of all of his protections and starts laughing before sending him back. The priest has never seen the statues shining so much, so Garm asks to see his status window right away. However, Cain has a bad feeling about this, so he runs away to the bathroom to check his status. It's worse than he ever expected, because every single one of his protections is level 10, double the highest level in this world. Cain knows that he needs to hide all of this, and sees a secret ability granted to him called Status Conceal which he uses to hide his strength. That night at lunch, Cain sat with his family who wished him a happy birthday. Garm asks him if they could finally see his status window, so he goes on to show it in front of everyone. All of his family is left in disbelief, as he's received the protection from all seven gods and has magic over 340,000. He's only five years old and is stronger than most mages in this entire nation, so his father panics and makes him promise to keep his stats a secret. Cain reluctantly agrees and goes to bed, seeing the notebook about summoning magic in front of him. Knowing that Sylvia won't be around, he tries to do his first summon to get a cute animal. In his mansion's backyard, he activates the summoning circle, but a giant monster appears from the inside. His sister and Parma scream in fear, and it's just like the last time he remembered. But this time, he promises it will be different. So he rushes to tackle the monster, but it punches him away and crushes his stomach. Even with all the pain, Cain promises that he will no longer allow the people he cares about to cry. He wants to protect others, so he uses all of the energy in his body to cast a spell that makes the monster disappear. As he lies on the floor, he sees the fluffy cat ears and wishes he could have touched them just one last time. He wishes he didn't have to make people cry again, and worries that he's going to get isekai'd. After a few minutes however, Cain wakes up and realizes that he's still alive. This time, the people he tried to protect aren't crying. In this world, he realizes that his powers can actually help save people. On the day of his birthday's ceremony, his father asks him what he aspires to become in his future. Cain reveals to everyone that he wants to travel across the lands and help all sorts of people, so in order to protect everyone's smiles, he will become an adventurer. After hearing the determination in his voice, Garm promised to hire a tutor for him. Inside his bedroom, he wondered what his tutor would be like, but she had finally arrived. Cain was so excited that he ran to the window and accidentally teleported outside, falling in the most convenient position possible. He apologized to the girl, and the butler introduced Cain's two tutors, Millie and Nina. Inside the mansion, Millie struggles while she fantasizes about why Garm has been given the title Biggest Wood in the Country. But Cain is too busy noticing that Nina is an elf. Garm says they don't need to be so formal, and Cain asks them to talk with him as if he was their friend. Millie is excited to finally teach him, and they begin lessons right away. Inside the mansion's training area, Kane demonstrates his swordsmanship prowess which shocks Millie. To evaluate Kane's abilities, she asks him for a mock duel. Immediately, Kane rushes forward to strike towards her and she barely manages to hold him back. Nina wonders if he's received the war god's blessing, and Kane says he was supposed to keep that a secret. Millie gasses out and begs Nina to teach him some magic before his sword penetrates her insides. Nina reveals that she has a level 3 magic protection, but Cain has already learned all the basics. He demonstrates his ability to summon magic from all the elements, and his spells are so powerful that they pierce through stone targets. Cain reveals that he's received the protection from the magic god as well, and Millie worries that they can't teach him anything after all. 
he pulls out a towel from his item box, and the girls realize that they're basically useless. If they were to try to teach him anything over here, he would end up destroying the entire manor. So Kane suggests they go outside the mansion to study. He's never left the premises, so Millie and Nina think it would be better for him to go outside anyway. They explain to Garm that Kane's abilities will destroy the mansion, and Garm panics when he finds out his son is this strong on the first day. He knew this day would come eventually, but hoped Kane would mature more first. Reluctantly, Garm agrees to let him go outside on the condition that he never enters the forest. Kane promises that he will, and he leaves the mansion for the first time with his tutors. Nina begins with his magic training and asks him to demonstrate his intermediate level magic. Immediately, Kane readies a fire spell and casts it towards the stone knocking both of the girls and leaving a giant crater where the stone once was. They wonder if consuming all that mana has tired him out, but Kane hasn't broken a single sweat. As he laughed off his accomplishment, Millie realized there were enemies nearby, and a rabbit jumped out from the bushes to attack Millie, but her attack missed. It rushed towards Kane, but he dodged the rabbit and shot air bullets to defeat it. Millie wondered if he was going to sell the drops, but Kane wanted to show it to his family, so he stored it in his item box. Millie is amazed since she's been saving up for years to get a magic bag, a less powerful version of his item box. In the meantime, Nina uses her search ability to scan within 300 meters for monsters. Kane thinks what she did was cool, so he tries to copy the same spell, casting it to locate the exact location of the four rabbits surprising Nina that someone could even count the specific number of monsters. He runs towards it, and Millie tells her that she should just give up already. They defeat all of the rabbits together. However, one of them runs away and Kane tries to pursue it, but Millie warns him to never go inside the forest since it has legendary monsters living inside. Every few decades, all the monsters try to break into the city which is why their wall is so fortified. Kane realizes how dangerous it is, but wishes to one day explore it on his own. That night, he realized that he'd already reached level 8 after beating just a few rabbits. He investigated the reason for his massive level up, and saw that the god-chosen title granted him 100 times more XP. But not only that, each level up granted him 100 times the ability points. Kane's power has already surpassed most humans, and he's realized that the entire nation is going to try and get rid of him if this continues. A few months later, Millie takes Kane to the Adventurer's Guild so he can fight some stronger monsters. Inside, Roxin. Sorry, wrong show. Inside, Ruby. F wrong show again. Rudy asks what brings them here today, and Millie wants to acquire some quests that would be perfect for Kane. However, a man comes and mocks Millie and Nina for being D-rankers and babysitting a child. Since she's a D-rank, he tells her to ditch the kid so he can show her what a real D looks like. Nina tells him to back off, but Cross is fed up with her disrespect and picks her up while two others restrain Millie. As he's about to grab her face, Kane holds his arm and says that he will not allow him to treat his tutors like that. Millie begs Kane to run, but Kane tells him that he needs to start training and smacks him in the face. Cross recovers and tries punching him, but Kane evades and destroys his footwork, saying that his name is Kane. But Cross continues trying to fight against him. He grabs a knife and tries to strike towards Kane with incredible speed, but Kane evades every single one of the attacks, going as far as to even hold his sword with his fingers and throwing him out. The other two hold a knife to Millie, but Kane makes quick work of them and kicks them out. Nina comes to hug Kane, promising that she'll protect him next time. After years of training and enjoying their time together, Kane has grown into a charming tall man. Sylvia lets him know that his final class with his tutors will be in a few days, and Kane is excited because he wishes to find a way to thank them. He remembers that Millie wanted a magic bag, so that night, Kane snuck into the deepest parts of the dark forests. A blood ogre appeared before him. Next, he defeated an earth dragon and the guards thought that a monster rampage was about to commence this decade. The entire army was deployed and Garm led the troops to defeat them. Kane's collected everything he's came to get and teleports away, leaving behind his towel. Garm arrives at the scene, and his subordinate informs him that all the monsters have been eliminated in the forest. Wondering who could be so overpowered, Garm looks at the ground to find his towel, shocking every bone in his body. The final day of Kane's tutoring arrives, leaving Millie and Nina with a bittersweet feeling for having been with him all this time. They come and let him know that today will be his graduation, and congratulate him on working hard for the last three years. Kane thanks them for all the time they've been with him, so he hopes that the magical bags he's created for them will show them how grateful he is. He's collected the materials from the Blood Ogre and Earth Dragon inside the forest. 
but he tells them not to worry, because they're just regular bags that won't hold too much, just an entire mansion. Millie tells him that the most expensive magic bag can only carry two carriages worth of items, so this magic bag would be national treasure class. Mill is worried people would try to rob them of it, but Kane reveals that he's enchanted them so that if anyone else carries these bags, they'll be as heavy as everything held inside of them. <laughs> Sensational. Millie and Nina thank him for doing all this, and they both get on their knees for him. That's not fair! That's not fair! They tell him that if he ever needs their help when he grows up, he can always come to them and they can help him with anything he needs help with. At that moment, their contract was over, and Kane felt like he grew a little more. And so did I. Months later inside a deep cave, Kane battled against a red dragon and struck it once, defeating it instantly. He's defeated one of the strongest mobs in existence. So when he examined his level, he realized his magic was over 80 million and he's earned the title Dragon Slayer. Two years have passed since that day. And Kane is finally 10 years old and will be attending a noble event to commemorate his birthday. It will take a week to reach their destination as long as monsters don't interrupt their travels. So Kane casts his search ability to scan a 3 kilometer radius. He discovers monsters have ambushed soldiers ahead and tells his dad to hurry so they can try to save the people. However, the horses are too slow, so Kane jumps out of the carriage like Spider-Man and activates his wind magic, dashing towards the source of the monsters. The soldiers are cornered and are about to all be defeated but Kane jumps in and saves one of the soldiers. He continues flying around, using his air cutter ability to decimate every single one of the monsters in his way. Still, a few beasts charge towards the carriage, so Kane summons his sword and destroys them with a single swing until he faces the boss. Immediately, he dodges the beast and jumps into the sky, enchanting his sword with fire before ending the monster in his way. The soldier warns him to stay away from the carriage, so Kane tries to introduce himself as the son of Garm. Just then, Garm's soldiers arrive and realize they're completely useless. The soldier collapses from losing all of the blood, so Kane holds him tight and activates his healing ability, helping every single soldier recover instantly. Garm finally arrives and sees the terrible scene that unfolded before him, but instantly recognizes the crest on the carriage as the royal families. From inside, two girls appear, Telestia, the princess, and Silk, the duke's daughter. They thank Garm for saving both of them, but Garm lets them know that it was his son Kane who saved them. Telestia nearly faints, so Kane goes on to use a relaxing spell to make her feel better. The light soothes all of their pain and anxiety away, but the little suckers enchanted it with some other type of magic. Immediately, Telestia runs over and thanks him for saving them. Silk holds his hand and thinks he's the greatest swordsman she's ever seen, but Telestia says that he's going to be hers, and they begin fighting over him. They drag him to their carriage and take him away in front of his father's eyes. Inside their huge carriage, Kane wonders why they're sitting so close to him, but Telestia is too scared for him to leave her. She tells him to call her Tellies, and Silk asks him to call her Silk. His spell was too strong, and they continue trying to charm him until he succumbs. The soldier informs them that they're finally approaching the rest area, and Kane thinks that this is a mess, but the girls want to rest with him after they arrive. At the rest area, Kane tries to escape this situation, but Telestia and Silk tell him that they want to spend the night with him or they'll be scared. Garm tries to say that it's inappropriate, but the girls claim they're too traumatized and are afraid of a dragon to come attack them. Garm says that he can take care of it, but Silk tells him that he's worthless compared to Kane. You're a victim! Mm. They beg Kane to stay the night with them, and he accepts if they would separate the beds as far as possible. Garm says he may have two wives, but he should be careful because he has to deal with twice the headaches. That's not ridiculous. That's not ridiculous to say that. Inside the bedroom, the girls beg him to sleep next to them and they push the beds close to each other. But pushing the beds next to each other wasn't enough, so they decide to use Kane like a body pillow all night. The poor Giga Chad has created his own harem at the age of 10, but he's already learned that he would rather be single for the rest of his life. He didn't get any sleep that entire night, but after a few more sleepless nights, he finally arrived at the capital. The head knight greets them and they continue clinging on to Kane. The knight bows to honor Kane's presence, having already heard the news of how Kane heroically saved everyone. 
As for the ones who were fallen, Kane's item box allowed him to return their bodies to their families. The bell rings and Kane tries to dip, but the knight informs him that he's going to be meeting with the king. Inside the heart of the castle, every major politician has gathered for Kane's audience with the king. He takes a bow, and the king's count commends him for being able to save Telestia and Silk from all fifty orcs single-handedly. To reward him for his bravery, the king bestows upon him a mansion, ten platinum coins, and the honorary title of baron. Some of the politicians think this is controversial, and some fatso waltz in and says it's not fair to be giving a child such wealth. The king tells Cornigo to learn how to stop opening his mouth before he stays fat his whole life. The king says he would have never been able to save the girls in his position. This kingdom needs more knights like Cain, so the king's decision will not change, sending Cornigo running away. The king asks if Cain will accept. With no room for objection, Cain humbly accepts all the awards, but the king isn't done with him and wants to talk with him in private. Garm and Cain wait to meet with him, and his father congratulates him on getting his own mansion before his other boys. The king enters along with the two girls, and Cain realizes that he can't tell the king about his daughter calling him daddy last night. The knight thanks Cain for saving his daughter, and the duke also expresses his gratitude for saving his daughter, Silk. The king tells him that there's something important that he's come to discuss, and asks him if he would take his daughter's and the duke's daughter's hands. He wouldn't be married yet but they will wait until he's an adult. After all, he linked arms with them and slept with two unmarried ladies. No one will ever take them as brides now, and he'd better accept this offering before he faces the wrath of the gods. Earlier on, this genius idea was concocted by the count to investigate the true identity of Cain. But the king was shocked to find out that both of their daughters wanted to marry Cain. Hearing of his great accomplishments, he was determined to keep Cain in this kingdom, and Cain thinks that this is the worst possible situation he's found himself in. Cain's father offers no advice, and the pressure of the entire situation begins to collapse onto him. With no other option but to give in, Cain accepts to become their husband. Telestia and Silk think they will never forget the nights they spent together, and Cain explains it was just a misunderstanding because of all the different positions they had to do. They ask him what the f he's saying, and Cain tries to say that he meant the position of the beds. Poor guy can't get a break. A few days later, Cain visited the royal church to meet with the gods. Zenim wondered what took him so long, but Cain explains that his stats had become too overwhelming. With his current stats, Cain's become the strongest human alive, so Zenim asked him if he would like to become a demigod. But even with a status like that, there are still limits to what Cain can achieve alone, so Zenim advises him to make strong relationships. He goes on to ask Cain if he would create some entertainment based on his knowledge from his previous life. Cain thinks he can create the perfect game, and Zenim and the god of technology beg him to create something like that. Later that day, Rini was shopping for some clothes, and Cain has had enough of her bro-con obsession. He ran out and noticed Parma outside, the girl he saved five years ago. Her uncle, Tamanis, introduces himself to Cain and is shocked to find out that he's as a noble. Cain asks him to just treat him like every other kid and asks him to browse his shop. It's an antique store where every item is crafted by Tamanis, so Cain asks him if he could make a special order for him. Tamanis is interested, so Cain shows him the blueprints of the game he's trying to create. With such an interesting concept, Tamanis thinks this would be a great hit, so Cain asks him to create a prototype and pays him a full gold coin for it. Tamanis couldn't accept such a high payment, but Cain tells him that he should treat it like an investment into their relationship. Tamanis humbly accepts and promises that he will create the best game board for him. Cain is glad and leaves the store, but finds out that Rianne is ready to destroy him for disappearing on her. She asks him why he didn't see all the clothes she tried on for him, but Kane says she would look like shit in all of them anyway. Emotional damage! Rianne is glad to hear that her brother thinks she's ugly, because she's going to teach him the hard way what he's supposed to say to her. This bitch is scary. She spends all night trying on different outfits to try and impress her Oni-chan and will now punish him by having him try them on. However, Sylvia comes in to save the day and informs him that Tamanis has finished the prototype. Inside his shop, Kane is amazed that it looks exactly like the reverse he imagined. They spend the afternoon playing the game together, and Tamanis thinks this will become the next trend and is positive it will become a bestseller. Kane suggests they create a fancier version for the nobles, since he's sure the wealthier people will want a fancier product. To begin with, Kane suggests making 50 of the noble version and 1000 of the normal version. 
Kamanis thinks he's a genius, but his company can't afford to create such a large inventory all at once. So Kane smashes some gold coins on the table like a top G. Kamanis promises he will create all of the boards as quick as possible to make sure their product isn't stolen. They create an off-brand patent by presenting the board to the commerce god and vow their commitment to the contract. The board begins to glow a golden hue in front of them, fulfilling their contract with the gods. Kane makes one more request and asks him if they could create an extravagant game for the royal family. Tamanis is honored that his company would ever be considered for such a project, and Parma thinks he's amazing for having connections with the king. Kane thinks she doesn't even know half of the story, because the gods are probably enjoying the game he just created for them. The next day is the debut ceremony, so Garm warns Kane to watch out for parents introducing their daughters to him. Kane says he won't because he's a top G and will create the largest harem, and Garm is shocked that his son is so ruthless. Inside the castle, Kane sees Cornigo with his children and thinks he looks nasty. The Duke and Silk meet each other, but his smile scares Kane. The Duke thanks him for saving his daughter and hopes they will have a favorable relationship. And Kane realizes that he's screwed, but he won't back down. In front of her own father, Kane tells Silk that she's the most beautiful girl in all of the lands and promises that he will never leave her unlike her father's ex-wife who cheated on him because he was so useless and ugly. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! <coughs> her father went on to say, You're ugly, you're disgusting, I'm gonna kill you, give me $200. Garm won't allow someone to roast his own son, so he tells the Duke that he's Silk's real father. It's an evil world we live in. They walk off and Garm tells Kane that he definitely destroyed every bit of his confidence, and Kane says he's glad he was born to such a gigachat. These fuckers are straight up savages. The royal guards blow the trumpets and the king makes his entrance. Kane doesn't care about anything he's saying because he's too smitten with the princess's beauty. After his speech, Kane greets the king and says that she's more beautiful than a goddess and her presence has him choking harder than she. He decides to not say that part, but then Kane promises Tellys that he will never leave her unlike the queen who's constantly sleeping with the royal guards. Who hurt this dude? The king tells Garm that he's a worthless dad for raising such a mistake of a child. But Kane goes on to say, I'm about to end this man's whole career. <laughs> Kane goes on to apologize for all his banter and gives the king with a gift as an apology. It is the reversey game he's developed with the company, and the king wants to hear all about it after finding out what his daughter's been actually saying. He commands him to come to his room later or he'll be executed, and Kane reluctantly agrees. Garm asks Kane when he became such a business magnate, and Kane says he needed to do this in order to take care of his mansion since he's richer than his own broke dad. Garm accepts the insult since all he's ever desired was for his children to become more successful than him, but wants Kane to make sure he can make friends with children his age. Kane is glad to have such a caring dad who helps him roast everyone, but just then, Silk comes and tries to steal him away. They sit together and Silk tries to make sure Tellys doesn't have a chance with him, but Cornigo's children come to interrupt their party. The guy says that she's wearing a beautiful dress, but Silk does her best to not say a word to him. One of his lackeys tells Kane that he should get out when Habit is having a private conversation. Kane tries to introduce himself, but Habit tells Kane that he should apologize for bothering Mrs. Silk, upsetting her. Kane tells her that he'll make Habit apologize first, and he tells her that he's being rude right now. Habit is infuriated and tells Kane to meet him in the parking lot, but they don't have cars in this world so they meet in the field. Silk is worried that Kane is going to be destroyed, so she does everything she can to hug him, but Habit is tired of not getting any attention so he tells them to begin the battle already. Silk doesn't give two shits what he's saying and hugs Kane tighter so he can protect her. Cornigo's lackeys get angry and they do some rain dance to make the lightning strike towards them. The next lackey thinks he can do the rain dance better, so he begins summoning his spell. <laughs> Silk tells them to stop all this crap already because Kane isn't just any ordinary child, he's a baron. Silk says that he's the third son of Margrave Garm. Silk says he saved the princess from an army of 30 orcs. She tells them his name is Kane. 
Cornigo and his lackeys bow to Kane, begging for his forgiveness, and run away like cockroaches. After they leave, Silks realized he could have revealed his status this whole time but just wanted to make them look dumb, so she'll tell the princess about it. Kane begs her not to, but Silk promises that she'll keep it a secret if they go on a date together. Tellys comes in and asks what they're keeping a secret, so Kane immediately stops Silk from speaking. Tellys tells him that she's going to tell on him for being so intimate with Silk. But Silk reveals that they're going on a date together. Tellys is jealous that she's been left out and wants Kane to make it up to her by going on a date with her as well. He thinks she looks cute, so he promises to go on a date with her. The king comes from behind and asks what he just said. Tellys goes on to say, Your mom's a ho! Kane realizes that he's raised a monster, and the king says that they're going to have a long man-to-man -man talk. And Kane realizes that he's finally going to be executed for all the jokes he's been saying. Indeed the king executed him, and this is the end of the story. This is so tragic. Please spam Rip Kane in the comment section because Silk and Tellys will now be widows. The next day, Kane reincarnates back because he's that overpowered, and when the king found out, he was about to execute him again. But the count did everything in his power to save Kane. The Duke comes in and congratulates him on his revival, but wants to play the creator in a game of reversi along with the rest of the palace, and Kane wishes he would have never been revived. After a week of hiding from the king, Kane is finally ready to see his mansion. He sees it's a rundown mansion that hasn't been maintained in years. With his magic, he investigates all of the rooms and decides to begin cleaning. With his magical powers, the entire mansion along with the backyard is automatically cleaned and repaired. Every one of the rooms returns to brand new, and Sylvia has finally made it here. She was extremely happy to hear that she's going to be his personal maid, so she's brought along an entire harem of maids and a butler to help him take care of all the nobility matters. Sylvia tries telling the maids to begin cleaning right away, but they tell her that there's not a speck of dust anywhere. Kane reveals that he cleaned everything up with magic, and Colin is surprised how nobody was shocked with his abilities. Sylvia begins preparing to receive all P.F. Kane's items, and Colin tells him to start heading home. Kane has completely forgotten that his older brothers will be coming home today. Back at Garm's mansion, Kane's brothers congratulate him on getting his own mansion before any of them, and they're glad that he's their younger brother. Kane shows his family around his new mansion, but Garm is confused because he remembers it being completely run down and destroyed. SB he asks Kane if he's the one responsible. Kane says he just remodeled it with a little magic, and Sarah is proud that she raised such a strong son unlike Garm's other wife. He goes on to take them for a tour of the house, but Garm wishes that Kane had decorated more. Nobles in this generation show their class with paintings, vases, and even mounted monsters. Kane thinks he has the perfect solution, so he disappears for a second to put one up. Just as he comes back, Sylvia begins screaming in fear, and all the maids are scared of the red dragon in front of them. Garm asks Kane what the meaning of this is, and Kane tries to say that this is a red dragon. Garm says no shit Sherlock, but wants to know why he has such a thing here in the first place. So Kane says that he defeated it alone. It's a calamity level beast that's never been defeated before, but Garm is glad to have such a strong son. A mounted red dragon is worth 10,000 platinum coins in this world, and Kane realizes that it's actually worth a hundred million dollars in his old world. Just then, Sarah screams in fear and they run together towards the bathroom. Sarah asks him what the toilet is, because it's made her feel better than Garm ever did. Thinking she's just exaggerating, Garm tries to investigate for himself. After he goes inside, Garm realizes that he's been missing out his entire life and thinks it will impress the visitors. But Kane wonders why he would ever have visitors. When a noble owns a mansion, they must hold a debut party and invite all the nobles, Garm explains. But doesn't want to deal with all of that again, and wishes he was just a brokey. Colin tells him he's prepared a list of people to invite to make things easier for him. As he looked through the list, Kane noticed Cornigo has been invited, but wishes he never had to see his face again. The only one that wasn't on the list was the king because only counts or higher ranked nobles can invite royalty. Kane realizes all the preparation and gifts he has to prepare, but has no idea what he could gift any of them. Sylvia suggests for Kane to create his own type of gifts along with his unique form of hospitality, and this inspires him. Using his magical abilities, he makes a cup made of glass since porcelain is the only material used for tableware. As for the food, Kane plans on serving everyone hamburgers, and Sylvia thinks it's the best food she's ever tasted. As for the drink, she takes a sip of carbonated wine and loves every bit of it. 
but says that she doesn't know how she feels about it. She wants to get another glass. She continues drinking all the bottles but Colin comes to inform him that the king has requested his audience. He's infuriated with Kane and asks him why he hasn't received an invitation to his debut party yet. He slams the desk and says that he's the one who's given him the mansion. But the duke waves his invitation in his face and says it's clear that Silk is the better daughter. The king is ready to cry and says that he's disappointed in how he's treating his future father-in-law. Kane tries to tell him the truth, saying that he's never been given the opportunity to hand him an invitation since he's so busy, so he's hand-delivered it for him today. The king takes it and shows off to his friends like a middle school girl who just got a love letter, and informs Kane that Tellys will be attending as well. The night of the debut party arrives, and Kane invites everyone inside. The duke arrives along with Silk, and Kane calls her the most beautiful- Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. They see his red dragon statue and Silk can't wait until she lives here with him. Colin informs Kane that it's the time for his address, and Kane thanks everyone for attending and hopes that his meager offering will please all of them. He raises the drink for a toast, and his parents try it out, loving the fizzy taste of it. Even the glasses impress them as they look like treasure chests, and Kane lets them know that he personally prepared them as gifts for everyone to take home. The king arrives and sees the beautiful drink waiting for him. After a single sip, he experiences the heavenly feeling of the soda fizzing in his mouth. As for the meal, he takes a bite of the hamburger and eats the meat until it squeezes the nice creamy white liquid. This is the first time he's experienced such a delicate combination of cheese and meat, and it feels like a harmony in his mouth. Tellys is enjoying Kane's meat. The queen tells the king that she just experienced a different kind of climax and begs Kane to install the same sprayer in the royal bathroom. Wondering what she's talking about, the king tries it out and climaxes so loud that everyone hears him. He exits the room like nothing happened and scolds Kane for withholding this sprayer from him because he needs it installed in his bathroom immediately. Kane promises he will, and the king says that his hospitality shows in everything including the food and his house, chanting that this is the ultimate hospitality. The entire crowd claps to congratulate Kane, filling him with joy for his efforts having been recognized. However, Colin informs him that trouble is on the way. Cornigo comes and calls Kane's mansion a doghouse as he walks in, so Kane doesn't let Colin inform him about the dragon statue. He screams in terror, and Kane apologizes that his expensive red dragon caught him off guard. He tries to walk it off and calls his taste poor, but everyone thinks Cornigo's attitude is vile for a person who arrived after the king. At the table, Sylvia offers him some of the carbonated wine, and he says it looks disgusting, but loves every sip of it. Kane offers him a hamburger and he calls it disgusting but continues eating every last bit of it. All of the nobles have noticed his mistreatment of Kane, and Colin warns him to try and stay composed which gives him a brilliant idea. He brings Cornigo glasses and explains that they're just a meager offering. Cornigo says they're meager all right, but wants every single one of them along with the recipe for the hamburger. Kane rejects because he's going to gift them to everyone here, but Cornigo is frustrated and screams at Kane to give him a hundred glasses immediately. Kane apologizes and tries to stall as another red object approaches. He says he's willing to offer the kingdom's biggest object, even more amazing than a jewel, making Cornigo excited to take it right away. He tells him to please accept the kingdom's biggest, and the king appears from behind him. This catches him by surprise, and Cornigo wonders why he's at such a lowly person's home. The king furiously responds that Kane saved his daughter, and the duke wonders if he came after the king. Regardless of Cornigo's lies, the king threatens to take his ranking away if continues mistreating Kane. Trying to weasel his way out of this, Cornigo claims he was just impressed by the meal and the hospitality, but the king tells him to start behaving like an actual noble and commands him to flee. Silk comes up to Kane and knows that he set all of this up, and the duke asks if he used them. Congratulations, you played yourself. A week later, Kane was walking when he was approached by Captain Dime. He was sent by the Prime Minister to leave some monster materials, so Dime leads him to the storage room. However, Kane thinks that this room is way too small. Dime is caught off guard and wonders if they're all the size of the Red Dragon in his mansion. But Kane says it's nothing like that, just the legendary Earth Dragon that a whole party of the strongest adventurers couldn't take down. Dime is shocked, but tells Kane to leave the monsters in the middle of the field, so Kane releases all of them from his item box. Seeing the sheer number of rare monsters, Dime asks Kane if he's a hero or a disciple of the gods, causing Kane to panic for a second. 
He says goodbye and tries to leave, but Dime asks him if he would like to train with the other knights and meet their leader. Kane realizes he's in deep once more. This was how the entire army was facing off against him, but let's see how this started. Dime had introduced Kane to the rest of the soldiers and informed them that they will be dueling him, but one of the soldiers wonders if they should really be battling against a 10-year-old. Since he was so worried, Dime suggested for him to fight Kane first. The soldier allows Kane to have the first move, and Kane happily agrees. In an instant, he activates his boost ability and vanishes before the man's eyes, defeating him with a single slash. Kane thanks him and begins trying to leave but Dime says that he should try fighting all of them at once. That was how we ended up in this situation. But just as Kane was about to be destroyed, the leader screamed at all of them to hold their position. She asked them why the entire army is about to fight a little child, and hugged him to try and comfort him. Kane is too bewildered by her being an elf and she asks Dime why he's put the child in this situation. Dime tries to explain that Kane was actually the one who saved the princess from 30 orcs alone. She finally understands, and she begs Kane to duel against her with a menacing aura. All the soldiers think that Kane lived a nice 10 years and wish him a happy afterlife. Kane asks her why she's holding an actual sword, but she tells him it makes things more interesting and begins rushing towards him. Kane attempts to fight her off, but her agility allows her to evade beautifully. She boosts her physical abilities and they rush towards each other and clash their swords. The soldiers are impressed that there's someone who can match her speed. Kane continues trying to parry her blows and create opportunities, but her defense is too strong. He resorts to using clock up and sprints towards her. But just then, he vanishes before her eyes and teleports next to her, pointing his sword at her throat. Kane says the duel is over, but she's just experienced the greatest climax in all of her life. She hugs Kane and tells him that she's going to be marrying him. Kane tells her that he hasn't even known her for 10 minutes, and she thinks he has a good point. She introduces herself as Tijuana, the daughter of a duke, and even though she may be older, she reassures him that elves can reach 300 years of age, so she will remain young for a long time. Kane runs away from this creep and says that she needs her father's approval first, but she tells him it's not a problem. Her family knew she would be lonely forever, so they won't allow her to return home until she's found a spouse. Still, Kane isn't okay with it because he needs to ask an entire army of people for permission first, and asks Dime to back him up but he's already fell asleep. The leader comes to her senses and tells Dime that she's going to meet with the king to make things better. Kane thinks this is the worst possible outcome, and Dime drags Kane to the king. Inside the king's castle, the king wonders why Kane has come back already. Tijuana gets up and even her voice changes as she tells him that they're going to get married. The king asks what's the meaning of this, and Kane explains that he beat her with his wooden stick so hard and penetrated deep into her defenses, so that's where they're at now. The other girls haven't heard of this, but that isn't the main issue. Darm explains that Tijuana isn't just the leader of the army, she comes from a kingdom filled with elves, and she's basically their princess. The king breaks the sad news to her, saying that Kane is already engaged to his daughter along with the dukes. Shocked by what she just learned, she thinks that Kane must be so incredibly amazing to have smitten both his daughter and the dukes. The king knows how hard it must be, but Tijuana thinks that she wants to marry him even more now. All of them wonder what type of copium she's taking, because I sure want some of it. But the king says he will only discuss this after she's gained her father's permission. Tijuana gladly accepts and tells Kane to come along. He wonders where, and she tells him that they're going to be battling with their sticks to deepen their love. The king wonders how the strongest knight in the entire kingdom was defeated, and he asks Garm if he knows the story behind Kane. However, Garm himself doesn't know anything about him at all, but Dime remembers him panicking when he brought up the gods so the king became suspicious. The count thinks they can test him by showing him that. The mythical book. Kane walks around, about to pass out from all the training for the last week. Just then, he hears her voice calling out for him and he tries to run away. But Dime grabs him and drags him to the king's room. Here we f***ing go again. The king asks Kane why he's appearing to be so sad, and Kane says he's tired of seeing his ugly ass. Yo. That one there was a violation, personally I wouldn't have it. The king tells him that he's brought him here to show him something. The count shows the book, an emperor-level magic text that's been passed down from the first king, Yuya. Kane asks if he can read this book, and the king gives him permission. He opens the book and realizes that he's seen all these spells and is glad to have learned now how to cast them. 
The king has finally realized it. He explains that the text in the book is one that none of them can read. Cain inspects it once more and realizes what he just read. The king explains that this text was written by the first king in a language called Japanese. Cain thinks it all makes sense since he definitely also reincarnated. And the king explains that no one's ever been able to read it. He asks Cain once more to explain who he truly is, and Cain realizes that he can no longer hide his true identity, but thinks he can trust these people. He asks them if they could keep everything they've heard a secret, otherwise, he will have to leave this kingdom. After the king agrees, Cain goes on to reveal that he has memories from his previous life. He used to live in the same land where the first king came from, a land called Japan. He apologizes for never telling them, and Garm asks if he's truly his child. Even if he didn't want to be born to such a brokey, the gods confirmed that Garm was his father when he turned five. The entire room is surprised that he met with the gods, and he goes on to tell them of how they were all crazy nutcases, but he meets them all the time. Garm asks him to show him his real status, and the entire room panics when they finally see all of his levels being beyond human. The king has no idea what they're going to do. After all, the god's chosen title is the epitome of the human race, and even kings should bow to him. Cain begs him to wait because that's not what he wants. Even though he has memories of his previous life, this is the life he's always wanted to live, and has everything he's ever wanted. A loving family, overpowered abilities, and people who care about him. There's nothing more honorable than living a life like this, because in his previous life, none of his family was still alive with him. But now, he's blessed with everything he could have ever dreamed for, and thanks his father for raising him all this time. He apologizes to the king for hiding the truth, but wishes for them to continue treating him the same way they always have. The king humbly accepts, and promises that he will be treated the same way as everyone else. However, he wonders if Cain should just be the king instead. Just then, Tijuana enters the room and shows him her father's consent to marry Cain. Here we go, another f***ing girl to the harem, and she takes him away with her. The duke tells the king not to worry because Cain will always be the same way he always has, and the king thinks they can truly trust him. He commands everyone in the room to keep this matter a secret. His only wish is for Cain to protect this kingdom, his family, the girls he cares about, and anyone who may ever need his help. In the years that followed, Cain began reading the book left by Yuya. The words said that if Cain can read this, then he is from the same home country as him, Japan. This book contains all the information about Yuya's life, including how he was isekai'd by Truck Kun. Unlike Cain, however, he wasn't reborn and was rather just summoned into this new world. Just as Cain kept reading, Silk and Tellies came and thought he was studying for the academy entrance exams. They begin offering to study with him, but Cain tells them that he doesn't have time to deal with their bullshit today. They ask him about tomorrow, but he runs off and says some other time. As he walked through the hallway, nutcase number three came sprinting towards him and asked him to train with her, but he said he will do it some other time. As he ran, he apologized to everyone, but today is a very special day for him, it's his 12th birthday. It's the day he will finally get to register as an adventurer. Inside the guild, he bumps into a red hare who notices he's young, so he reminds him that he's only got one life and to be careful. Cain wonders where he's seen that hare before, but approaches the receptionist who asks him if he would like to register. As he filled the paperwork, he decided to conceal his barren status since it didn't have anything to do with adventuring, and handed the paper to the girl. She then asked him to prick his finger for a blood magic test, and offered him his G-rank adventurer's card. Cain remembers his tutors being D-rank, and wonders how they're doing right now. The woman introduces herself as Riida and says it's nice to meet him. But just then, three guys come up and tell her to ditch the brat and hang out with them because they'll keep her company all night. Cain thinks, Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Their leader tries to kick Cain away but ends up falling instead. The lackeys try to retaliate, and both of them rush towards him but clash into each other. Their leader prepares to draw a sword, but Cain tells him to just wait. At the same moment, the red-haired guy approaches and tells him that if he wants someone to fight, he can fight him all night. They run away after recognizing Claude, and Cain's tired of feeling deja vu. Cain thanks Claude for his help, but Claude noticed that he would have probably destroyed them alone, so he asks him to have a drink with him. Since Cain is still 12, he gives him some fruit juice and asks him how he was able to pull off those incredible moves. Cain says he's been training since he was young with two tutors, and Claude is caught off guard and wonders where he's heard that before. Claude raises a cheer for him becoming an adventurer today and drink together. Cain wonders why the guys said he's with Ice Flame, so Claude reveals that the name of his party is the Ice Flame. 
he uses a flame sword and his wife uses ice magic. And because they trust each other, they can take big quests and rank up quickly. Kane is surprised to see a gold card since it means he's an A rank. But Claude thinks it's nothing compared to their first king who had a triple S rank. Just then, a wand hits him in the head, and his wife asks him why he's drinking. Claude introduces his wife as Lena, and she slams his head to not change the subject. Kane tries to introduce himself and tells her that Claude saved him, and she thinks he's a cutie. If there's any guys who bother him, Lena says she will take care of them. But Claude reveals that Kane would have covered the floor with blood if he hadn't stopped him. Lena hits him in the head and tells him to stop drinking before she covers the floor with his blood, and drags him away by the ear. Poor dude was never seen again after that day. Kane wonders what quest he should take as G rank, and wonders if he should just start by transporting items with his item box, but thinks that would be too boring. Instead, he sees a quest about defeating as many goblins as possible with no upper limit on the reward. So he takes that quest right away. Excitedly, he runs out of the guild, but Tijuana comes running after finally finding him. She asks him what he's been doing, and he reveals that he's going on his first adventure today. So Tijuana gives up all of her obligations for the day. Kane tries to run away, but Tijuana drags him away again. Poor dude was never seen again after that day. Deep in the forest, Tijuana is excited to spend some alone time with her husband in such beautiful scenery, and drags him away while wondering where the goblins could be. Kane uses his search ability and discovers the goblins to be ahead, so Tijuana tells him she will rush there, and she asks Kane to chase after her. Whatever she's on is stronger than copium, and I need some of it. As they arrive at the location of the goblins, Tijuana spots a civilian who's about to be destroyed so they teleport right away to save him. Kane casts his heal spell while Tijuana rushes towards them and slashes the three goblins standing in her way. A bigger group approaches them, so Kane enchants her physical abilities with his magic to power her up. Tijuana thanks him for filling her up with his warm magical fluid. She rushes towards the goblins to destroy all of them. Whether it's in sickness or in health, she vows to stay by his side and wants his blade for their first joint task. This bitch is psychotic. Kane wonders how he's always ending up with these nutcases, but the green lizards appear and Kane tells her that he will take care of it. She runs away with the man, and Kane casts his light ball, along with an ice pillar to destroy every single one of the green lizards. Tijuana thinks she has the best husband ever. Later that day, Millie and Nina wonder why there's a giant crater here instead of the green lizards, and Nina wonders why she's feeling deja vu. Inside the guild, Kane reveals that he's defeated the green lizards and wonders if he would be able to get the rewards even though he didn't claim the quest. Rita is confused because defeating a group of them is usually something done by C-rank adventures, but Kane explains that he defeated about 30 of them. Rita is shocked and runs to the chief to tell him the situation. He asks her to meet the guy immediately. Cedric introduces himself and asks Kane how he managed to get the green lizards. After all, he's a kid who's a G rank on his first quest, so there's no chance he could even kill a single lizard. Rita tells Cedric that it's wrong to be accusing him of cheating, and Kane agrees, saying he defeated them normally. Cedric says that he was registered as a commoner so he's likely just trying to swindle reward money, and screams that he will have his guild card removed. Kane thinks this is the worst situation ever, but just then, the guild master enters and the chief tells him that the brat over here is a cheater. The guild master sees Kane and thinks he looks interesting. He sits down and asks the chief why he thinks Kane is cheating. He hears out his reasoning and tells Cedric that he's got a lot to learn. He tells someone to come in, and Tijuana enters and yells that she's glad to see her husband. Kane tells her they were supposed to keep their engagement a secret, and pushes her off to ask her what she's doing. Tijuana says she's here to warn the guild about all the orcs and lizards, and the guild master reveals that he's known he's a baron. The chief is surprised, and the guild master tells him that he was the one to save the princess and Silk from the orcs. He goes on to say that he's the son of Margrave Garn, and if he marries Tijuana, they will become brothers-in-law. Kane is surprised that he's Tijuana's brother, and the guild master asks Cedric if he's going to continue insulting his brother-in-law. Cedric instantly bows his head, and Tijuana says that usually a commoner insulting a noble would get executed, but Kane says he would never do that. He accepts his apology and asks him to avoid making accusations in the future. The guild master tells Kane they will gladly accept his lizards, but he won't be able to stay at a G rank, so as a token of apology. He promises to raise his rank to C rank immediately. Tijuana thinks that it's too low since he's already defeated a red dragon and beat her in duels. Cedric wonders just how strong this guy is, so Tijuana's brother agrees that he should raise him all the way to A rank. He commands Rita and Cedric to take care of the paperwork, 
and Tijuana's brother apologizes on behalf of his subordinate's rudeness. He thanks Kane for being understanding and for taking care of his sister because she probably strong-armed him into this marriage. Tijuana tells him that they've already performed love's first joint task, and Kane thinks she's going to be giving everyone a misunderstanding. However, her brother knows better than anyone how lonely and stupid his sister is. Kane is glad he isn't the only one with some sanity, and the gods think that Kane truly never changes. The god of magic wonders why Zenim chose to double all of his protections, and Zenim tells them that he needs to become even stronger. Aaron's seal will be broken soon, and the world will be in trouble when that happens. It's been 300 years since he was sealed, so Kane needs to be trained even more before Aaron comes to destroy the world's peace. There is only one way to train Kane, and all the gods agree to have Kane train underneath the mysterious man. After oversleeping on the day of his exam, Sylvia breaks in and panics because she didn't wake him up early enough, so she offers her maid milkers for breakfast. However, Kane runs away and she cries because he only likes mommy milkers, but he tells her that he'll drink her milk later. He teleports to the exam site, and while walking to class, he wonders why Tellies and Silk weren't taking the exam with him. The teacher begins the two-hour exam, but with Kane's previous knowledge from the other world, he finishes all of it within 30 minutes and sleeps for the rest. After the written exam was over, the teacher took them to the field for their magic assessment. They will be shooting their strongest spell at the target and she tells them not to worry because there's a defensive barrier around the training area. The other kids begin shooting their fireballs, and Kane realizes that he can't use his ultimate inferno ability, so when she calls him up, he casts a simple fireball that turns blue. Even the teacher hasn't seen this level of magic before and tries to stop him, but Kane launches his fireball towards the target, annihilating the entire field for kilometers. He thought it would be safe to use beginner level spells at full power since there's a barrier, but the teacher thinks it's impossible for someone to be this strong when they're this young. She rushes to make sure no one was harmed, and tells them to begin the swordsmanship exam for now. At the new field, the professor introduces the adventurers who will be conducting the exam, and Kane notices Claude is one of them. He wonders what Kane is doing here and decides to duel him, saying he's just trying to assess his abilities. Knowing that he's an A-level adventurer, Kane activates his boost ability and rushes towards Claude. They clash against one another and Kane parries every single one of his attacks. While they continue sparring, Kane begs Claude to relax since he would have destroyed any other student. But Claude is enjoying this and activates his boost ability. Even with his enhanced speed, Kane manages to fend off all of his attacks, but worries that he'd break the other kids' bones with his strikes. The teacher yells at them to stop their sparring because all of the kids have just pissed themselves. Claude realizes he's taken it too far and promises to have another sword fight with Kane later. But the teacher comes and tells him that the exam is over and that he should only come back for the results. Kane realizes how bad this is, but Claude pretends like he didn't cause a problem. At home, Sylvia asks him if he's ready for some maid milk, but Kane tries to ignore her and says he finished the exam and that everything went just right. She's happy to hear this and wants to give him some milk to celebrate this success, but Kane thinks he's not hungry. Why the Lying. Why? Why you always lying? She gets angry because he's clearly lying and runs away crying to never be seen again. <laughs> he called. Inside the castle, the king asks Kane what he's done this time, and Kane says he's tired of always having to see his fat ass face in this stinky room. He's so angry for constantly dealing with all this bullshit that he wanted to destroy the entire school and make the king pay for all of it. And if the king won't stop having these visits, then Kane will use his emperor-level magic to destroy his entire castle. The king tells him to shut up already and asks where he took the exam. Tellies and Silk didn't see him, and Kane remembers not seeing them either, saying he entered through the south gate and never saw any of them. The king asks Kane if he knew that the academy has two entrances, and Kane reveals that he knew the north one was for the nobles while the south one was for peasants. The king asks his dumb ass which one he took and Kane realizes he's been destroyed. He tells Kane to stop talking shit and says that his father should have raised him better. He's caused so many problems that when the teacher approached the duke to tell him about the incident, he knew it was Kane being the usual moron, and started laughing because he was going to destroy him with this information. After the count revealed the repair bill, Kane wished he was nicer to them now, so the king asks him who the ugly ass is again. The kings had enough of this little skit, 
and tells Kane to leave already. The day of the results arrives and Kane looks to see his ranking but can't find it anywhere. Silk runs in and congratulates him on being the top of their class. Her father had tried making fun of him for entering the wrong gate, but hearing how he destroyed the entire area made her want him to destroy her entire area. What do you mean by that? And since Telly's isn't here, they don't need to worry about her finding out. But Kane knows this will end poorly. At the entrance gate, Kane sees his sister and she runs because she hasn't had any CISCON developments in half a season. Congratulating him on being the one to give the speech since he's the top of the class. He's never heard about this, but she just hugs him harder. Meanwhile, Sylvia is wondering if anyone's ever going to want her made milk, and Kane finally arrives. She asks him if he wants some milk, but Kane wishes he didn't see her ugly ass again. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE His words crush her, but she hugs and congratulates him on passing to mask her feelings. She knew he would pass all along, so to celebrate, she's going to produce the best milk for him tonight. Kane wonders what the f**k is wrong with this post-menopausal bitch. The butler tries saying she's just happy, but Kane thinks that she'll never get a man like this. During the ceremony, Kane finally waves to the best mommy milkers in the entire kingdom. Rejuvenated, whatever the f**k that word means. He charmingly asks Tellys and Silk to study with him throughout the years. He says that he will call them beautiful in front of their fathers again, and the girls look forward to it. Once the ceremony begins, all the guys are jealous of him, but all the girls want to feel him. The teacher calls Kane up to the stand. In front of everyone, he admits that he's the d**ks who mixed up the wrong entrances and took the commoner exam. However, he's a genius and knows how to twist this. He goes on to say that just like the first king, who wasn't actually useless like this current king. He believes that everyone should study and make friends equally. Regardless of bloodline or nobility status, he prays they can all get along together. Garm is glad that his child can twist every situation the same way he's about to twist Sarah's plot. The king overheard the slander and came to bully Kane in front of everyone. He congratulated them on being accepted, and is sure they won't be useless like this spineless dweeb next to him. The girls and the duke are glad that Kane is finally getting a taste of his own medicine, and the king goes on to apologize that they're going to be dealing with the failure that Garm raised. Little sucker is finally getting what he deserved. The first class is finally going to begin, and Kane is late after crying in the bathroom for an hour. The teacher introduces herself and tells everyone to think about their future plans. Kane thinks he's going to be a free adventurer, and the girls are excited to accompany him on his adventure. He asks them what they're planning, and Tellys reveals that she's going to be studying internal affairs so she can manage his future kingdom. Silk thinks she will also study commerce to help his future domain. This is a straight-up slave harem. After class is over, Kane walks over to see Parma getting bullied by Habit and his lackeys. They make fun of her for being a commoner, and tell her to drop out of the school right now. The knight in shining armor comes and tells them to treat everyone equally instead of picking on others. They realize it's Baron Kane, and he tells them that Parma is his friend, regardless of her nobility status. Habit thinks he will tell his father to ruin her entire family, but Silk tells them to repeat what they just said. Tellys wants to hear them too, and they realize they're screwed. She wonders if she should report their insolence to her father, but they apologize like the cockroaches they are and run away. Kane apologizes to Parma and asks to pet her cat ears, but the girls realize he's too close to the girl, so Silk commands him to sit on his heels. The poor married simp has already understood how life works, so he behaves like a good boy and wonders what they're talking about. However, as he realizes he should just get a divorce, a voice laughs in his head and asks him to come have a chat with him. The mysterious man is waiting inside the library and asks Kane to come inside. He gets up and goes to open the library door, getting teleported to a different dimension. The guy asks him if he would like coffee, but Kane wonders how this guy even knows what coffee is. The man tells Kane that he's been waiting for him this entire time, and that his name is Sheena. The mysterious man tells Kane that there's no need to be guarded, after all. He knows that Zenim reincarnated him here. Kane wonders how he knows the gods, and the man finally introduces himself. He is Yuya, the first king of this country. Kane remembers reading all about him in the Emperor level text, but wonders if he's a ghost since it's been 300 years. After inspecting him using judgment, he sees Yuya has the special title God of Creation. The world they're currently in is Fabnail, and since Yuya created it, he's the God of Creation of this world. Zenim and the rest of the gods wanted Kane to be trained but he thinks that he's already the strongest person alive. Even with his power, however, Yuya asked Kane to try stealing the cookie, 
but as he leapt forward, Yuya unsheathed his sword to prevent Kane from moving. Kane wondered why he needed to be this strong, and Yuya told him that there's someone he needs to fight. 300 years ago, this person made all the people in the world fight each other. Using an oracle, he sowed the seeds of distrust among everyone, subconsciously forcing them to fight. That man is the evil god Aaron, and Yuya narrowly managed to seal him away 300 years ago. But recently, that seal has started to loosen, and since Yuya is a god of this world now, he can't interfere in that world, so it's all up to Cain. However, Yuya tells him that his previous life will come into play and teleports him to the middle of the ocean. He promises that he will teach Cain more if he completes the task and disappears. Cain begs him to tell him more right now, but Yuya only gives him a compass that points back to his mansion. His mission will be to level up to 600 if he even wants to stand a chance against Aaron. And since Cain is only level 300, he wonders what'll happen to his school if he will be gone for a long time. Yuya tells him not to worry since a year in this world is equal to one day there and disappears. But Cain begs him to wait a minute. Yuya teleports back, telling him he can either do it or don't. Cain's realized that he has no other options, so he rushes into the forest. A serpent appears to attack Cain, but he dodges all of its attacks and rushes to slash the giant bear standing in his way. It has been less than five minutes, and he's already faced countless S-rank beasts. Back in the other world, Sylvia panickingly opens the door to see Tellies and Silk. She apologizes for panicking because she hasn't seen Kane all day, but they tell her that they haven't seen him at school either. After hearing that, Sylvia worries he's been kidnapped or imprisoned, or even stuck in a ditch. But Tellies tells them that he's fine because he always manages to find a way out of everything. If they wait here, she's sure he will eventually appear. A giant bear is about to devour Cain, but he annihilated it with his magic. It's been four months of being stuck in this forest without any sleep, so his mind is starting to break. He hears a puppy whimpering and begins walking towards the source of the noise. Once he arrives, he sees the tiny white puppy who's been injured badly and thinks that he will put it out of its misery. But as he raises his sword, he sees the look on the puppy's face and remembers that same sad look on the girl's faces. Kane drops his sword and apologizes for scaring it. After all, he's always just wanted to protect someone. He hugs it close and uses his extra heal. But since it's not enough, he puts every last bit of his mana into healing it, and passes out after consuming all his energy. Hours later, the puppy defends him against all of the beasts, and Kane realizes that it was trying to protect him while he slept. The puppy jumps onto him and starts licking him. He sees that it's been alone all this time just like him, so he asks it if it would like to accompany him on his trip, and gave it the name Haku. It was the only sort of companionship that allowed him to continue moving forward, because no matter how bad things got, there was now someone he needed to protect, and so the years passed. Eventually, Kane finally made it to Yuya's mansion, and Yuya was surprised to see how much bigger he's gotten. It's been around four years, and he sees the Fenrir next to him, telling Kane that he's a legendary holy beast. If he's managed to gain his trust, Kane might be able to summon him at any time using a contract summon. So Kane gives it a try and Haku disappears. Yuya tells him he can summon him back at any time, but his training isn't over and he will be practicing under his teacher, Durain. Kane is excited to have a new master, but he first wants to learn about Eren and his previous life. Yuya remembers his promise and tells him that they will begin talking before he leaves. At the training site, Durain says that Kane isn't strong enough. Yuya is stronger than Durain, and since Eren is stronger than Yuya, Kane stands no chance. Kane tries boosting to hit Durain, but he instantly evades and delivers a devastating blow to Kane's guts, knocking him unconscious. He wakes up to a ceiling he's never seen before, and Haku comes to lick him. While going downstairs, Kane sees a hot elf girl, and she introduces herself as Ruri and promises to make him some food. The baby dragon sneezes and Kane rushes down to meet it, but Haku jumps on top of him out of jealousy. Why am I always getting deja vu? Rory's finished preparing the meal and Kane takes a bite, realizing he hasn't eaten something this good in years. Durain tells him to eat up as much as he wants, and Rory tells him she can give him some elf milkers if he wants some too. While preparing dough, Silk sighs in sadness, but Tellies tells her that she's sure Kane will be fine, so they should do their best to create something good for him. Sylvia tells them to hurry up and move their hands or her milkers will be the only ones that Kane gets to experience. The girls realize why this girl's never dated anyone. Durain continues beating Kane down, and he's glad that Kane's finally withstanding some hits. After months of this training, he's finally managing to get home on his own feet, and the baby dragon is still being a tsundere. After a year of training, Kane was still being beaten down, 
but the anger of having to stop Aaron kept him moving forward. He remembered the day when Yuger revealed everything about his past life. Aaron used to be the god of amusement, the eighth god of Zenim's world. The gods had asked Cain to make them a game because there's no more entertainment in this world. When Aaron used the oracle, he was forcing every person to participate in a death game, and if he ever breaks the seal, he will end up forcing everyone to participate in this game once more. The only way Cain can prevent this is if he gets stronger, so Cain continued fighting to protect those who were important to him. But after all this time, Yuya still had one thing left to tell him. He was the one who was unable to protect his friends. The reason Aaron is connected to Cain's old life was because of this one reason. The friends Yuya failed to protect were Cain's parents. After they died in an accident, they were reincarnated into Cain's new world and were begged by the gods to bring peace to this new world. But even as Cain's mother casted Inferno, she realized how ineffective her attacks were. Cain's father and Yuya tried slashing against him and landed a scratch, but with a single magical blow, he annihilated their entire troop forces. Cain's mother tried protecting the priestess, but the injuries she sustained couldn't be healed. Cain's father used Overload to rush forward with all of his power and sacrificed himself to restrain Aaron from moving. In that instant, Yuya used the stone to seal away Aaron. His parents' last words were apologizing to their son. After hearing their words, Cain knew that he wanted one thing. He wanted to protect the people he cared about and make this a peaceful world. So he used his overload, and defeated Durain once and for all. Durain congratulated him on finally finishing his training, and Cain ran towards his parents' graves. Yuya reveals that even as they prepared for their final battle against Aaron, they were always looking for a way to get back to him. Cain's glad he finally found out the truth, thanking them for always thinking of him, and thanks Yuya for looking after his parents. Yuya opens his fist one final time, and Kane's speed surpasses Yuya's. He thanks Yuya for all the training, but Yuya tells him that he was the one who put in all the work. He runs off to his old world, but Yuya tells him to wait. His body's completely different after five years, so he casts a spell to return him to his original form. Haku appears to accompany him on his journey, and Durain asks him if he would be able to take Jin along with them. He promises that he will take care of Jin, and thanks them for taking care of him. As he prepares to teleport to the other world, Yuya hands him a gift for the current king. Durain looks forward to the day he becomes greater than both of them, but Yuya is sure it will be soon. After all, he has something much greater to protect than they do, and there's also lots of people protecting him. Sylvia sees that Kane is finally back and rushes to give him some of her maid milkers. He tells her to get her lonely ass off of him because he didn't miss her one bit in those five years. You're a victim! Mm. He only missed Telly's and Silk, and they're glad he's finally back. They show him the cookies they've prepared for him, and Kane cries while he starts eating them. They're glad he enjoyed them, and they welcome him home. Watch this next video, till next time my fellow legendary plot masters.